Air shows are one of the world's most popular outdoor attractions. Although it is well over a hundred years since the Wright brothers became the first to fly and control a powered aircraft, flight never ceases to mesmerize. Each year, millions of people flock to airfields, from enormous military air bases to small grass airstrips. In the United Kingdom alone, there are over 250 civil flying displays that can expect over 2 million spectators. For some, it is the prospect of seeing the latest military technology. For others, it's the joy of watching classic aircraft of yesteryear being put through their paces. Then there are the aerobatic pilots who perform maneuvers that seem to defy the fundamental laws of flight. Finally, there are the display teams who demonstrate a level of precision and timing that leaves spectators open-mouthed in amazement. In some respects, little has changed since the first flying displays, which are almost as old as flight itself. Perhaps we are so air-minded because so much of aviation's evolution has been done in the public eye. The first aviators were invariably showmen. They had to be in order to stake their claim for whatever milestone they were striving to achieve, whether it was flying faster, further or higher than their peers. But there was always risk. Tragedy was never far away, an open-mouthed amazement at the spectacle of a man and machine performing feats never imagined possible could, and did, quickly turn to wide-eyed horror. The world's first formally organised air show was held at Reims in France during August 1909. And what an event it was! Over 500,000 visitors streamed into a specially built grandstand in fields outside Reims for the Champagne region's Great Aviation Week. France regarded herself as the centre of world aviation. Only the month before, Louis Blériot had completed the first cross-channel flight, an achievement that had seemed almost impossible. Europe was now ablaze with excitement at the prospect of seeing Blériot and his fellow aviators demonstrating their flying machines. A 10-kilometre course was laid out around four pylons, and the Champagne houses put up a prize pot of 200,000 francs, about $40,000. There were to be prizes for speed, distance, altitude and passenger carrying. The Grand Prix was for distance and was the richest of the events, but the most prestigious was the Coupe Internationale d'Aviation. This event was to be a time trial between national teams. It carried a prize fund of 25,000 francs and an elaborately decorated trophy and was to be awarded to the fastest flight over two laps of the 10 kilometer course. It was donated by American newspaper publisher James Gordon Bennett. However, much of the rest of the site was farmland. Haystacks stood where crops had been harvested and more than one flyer was to fall foul of these obstacles. Despite Blériot's best efforts, the Gordon Bennett Trophy was won by the sole American aviator, Glenn Curtis. Curtis's victory was the high point of a pivotal week for aviation. 38 aircraft had been entered for the event by the world's best pilots. Although only 23 actually flew, it was the first time that aircraft had been tested in competition. The success of the Reams meet spawned a new industry in which entrepreneurs hoped to replicate its success and its profits. Airshows were now big business, although some were more successful than others. Dubbed by the press, with some justification, the foolhardy one, Adolphe Pegoud began his flying career as a test pilot for Louis Blériot in 1913. Although he only had a few months flying experience, Blériot recognised a pilot with an innate feel for flying. Pegoud's first job for Blériot was to demonstrate a hook and cable system for landing aircraft on ships at sea. 
Next, he became the first pilot to attempt to parachute out of his plane. The plan was for him to release the parachute before climbing out of the cockpit. Unfortunately, when the chute opened, it immediately dragged Pegoud out of the cockpit and along the length of the fuselage, giving his shoulder a good whack as he cleared the stabilizer. But he succeeded in clearing his plane and floated down, landing in a tree. From there, he watched as his pilotless plane started to do tricks on its own accord. A dive, a vertical climb, a wing slip, all the time writing itself between these manoeuvres. Pegoud quickly realised that a well-balanced machine in the hands of a cool-headed pilot could perform manoeuvres previously considered impossible. He then began to slowly and methodically develop the intricate manoeuvres that would become his repertoire. This eventually led him to performing the first loop in September 1913, which up until that point had been considered impossible. It was Adolphe Pigoud who effectively wrote the first aerobatics manual. His manoeuvres soon became the standard evasion tactics used by combat pilots as Europe descended into the First World War. But Pigoud himself was shot down and killed on August 31, 1915, aged 26. He had been flying for just three years. The start of the First World War signalled the end of aviation's first and arguably most colourful decade. Man had come a long way since the Wright brothers' first flight at Kitty Hawk. By 1914, aircraft had flown as high as 20,000 feet, travelled at 127 miles an hour, flown over 653 miles without a stop, and some 2,000 men and women had become aviators. Their machines were still flimsy and light, usually made of fabric stretched over a wooden frame, and aero engines were still desperately unreliable. But four years of war was to change all that. During the First World War, it can be said that aviation came of age. The first role for aircraft had been reconnaissance, using flimsy pre-war types like the BE-2, seeing here amazing crowds on the beach at Blackpool. The BE-2 was good in this role because it was slow and stable. But soon, airmen started shooting at each other to stop them seeing what the enemy was up to. As a result, owning the sky, or air superiority, became an important objective in its own right. And so the fighter was born. A good fighter had to be fast and agile, like the Sopwith Camel or Triplane. In fact, the Sopwith Triplane was so successful that the Germans got Dutch designer Anthony Fokker to copy it. The result was a lethal killing machine, made famous by the greatest air ace of them all, Baron Manfred von Richthofen. Fokker's other great invention was to devise a mechanism that enabled the pilot to fire his guns through the propeller without shooting the tips off. This meant that all he had to do was point the aircraft towards the enemy to be in with a chance of shooting him down. Naturally, there are very few examples of these aircraft flying today, although there are a number of faithful replicas that are regularly seen at air shows. What we don't see today are the big bombers and transports that were built in the last years of the war. These are the aircraft that did so much in the immediate aftermath to open up the world to air travel. This Vimy is, of course, a replica of a bomber that was designed for the RAF, but entered service just as the war ended. It was then used by Alcock and Brown to make the first transatlantic flight. A number of other records followed, including the first flight to Australia. These flights were made in the full glare of the press, which had the effect of getting the public excited and interested in aviation once more. Today, many regard the 1920s and 30s as a golden age of aviation. The British-based Aerosuperbatics team of wing walkers have been a regular spectacle on the airshow scene since the early 1980s. The format is simple, a girl on a wing 
performing gymnastics while the aircraft below her performs aerobatic maneuvers. It is a display that harks back to the barnstorming daredevils of the 1920s and 30s. Britain and America's war industries were still working at full capacity when the armistice was declared in November 1918, and it would take time for them to wind down. Now there were storage facilities full of military aircraft that nobody needed. Similarly, pilots were being trained in their hundreds, but having tasted the magic of flight, there were many skilled young men who did not want to return to their previous jobs in offices and factories. As aircraft could be bought cheaply, they turned their skills to earning a living by entertaining the public. This Avro 504 is typical of the aircraft that went on to have long careers after the war. Designed as a military trainer in 1913, nearly 9,000 504s were built over the next 20 years. Many members of the public had their first ever flight in a 504 as they and their pilots toured the country giving joyrides. The Boeing Stearmans, used by the Aero Superbatics team, first appeared in 1934 as military trainers. The type was very successful, with over 10,000 built. After the Second World War, many were sold off to civilian operators who used them for crop dusting. In America, Pilots like Lincoln Beachy became household names, guaranteed to bring in tens of thousands of spectators. The early barnstormers travelled the country, offering flights for a few dollars or shillings, as well as performing daring stunts and aerobatics. Of course, the more daring the stunt, the more the crowd loved it. This way, the pilots could earn just enough to keep their bellies full and their machines topped up with just enough fuel to get them to the next town. It was a precarious existence and soon spectators began to want more for their money. Pilots began banding together to put on little air shows with a variety of acts such as parachute jumpers and wing walkers. For the latter, they were indebted to the young daredevil flyer named Orma Locklear, who was to become the most celebrated aerial exhibitionist in the world. Locklear first went wing walking while still a military pilot. His excuse was that he needed to make an urgent repair to his aircraft. The Army Air Service was already losing too many pilots in accidents in the rush to get them through training. But rather than court martial Locklear, they let him carry on demonstrating his tricks, as commanders reasoned it showed that the aircraft were not killing machines. Today's air shows come in many guises. There are the enormous trade shows like Farnborough, Paris, Dubai and so on. For those who want to see the latest military aircraft, then Miramar near San Diego, California and the Royal International Air Tattoo, or RIAT, are the world's largest. Typically, an airshow will aim to appeal to as wide an audience as possible. Thus, most airshows feature preserved classic wartime aircraft, aerobatics, and demonstrations of modern military aircraft. Many air shows also offer a variety of other aeronautical attractions such as wing walking, radio controlled aircraft, water drops from firefighting aircraft and simulated helicopter rescues and skydiving. There is a huge variety of aircraft that will thrill spectators. For example, specialist aerobatic aircraft have powerful piston engines, lightweight and big control surfaces making them capable of very high roll rates and accelerations. A skilled pilot will be able to climb vertically, perform very tight turns, tumble his aircraft end over end and perform manoeuvres during loops. 
Solo military jet demos, also known as tactical demos, generally feature one aircraft, usually a strike fighter or an advanced trainer. The aim of these demonstrations is to present the capabilities of modern aircraft used in combat operations. The display will usually demonstrate the aircraft's very short and often very loud takeoff rolls, fast speeds, slow approach speeds, as well as their ability to quickly make tight turns, to climb quickly, and their ability to be precisely controlled at a large range of speeds. Tactical demos may also include simulated bomb drops, sometimes with pyrotechnics on the ground for added effect. Aircraft with special characteristics that give them unique capabilities will often display those in their demos. For example, Russian fighters with thrust vectoring may perform Pugachev's Cobra or the Cool Bit, among other difficult manoeuvres that cannot be performed by other aircraft. Similarly, an F-22 Raptor pilot may hover his jet in the air with the nose pointed straight up. A Harrier or Osprey pilot may perform a vertical landing or vertical takeoff, and so on. Miramar is a free show hosted by the United States Marine Corps to mark Fleet Week at the end of September. As it is a free show, it regularly attracts around 500,000 visitors over three days. As well as being able to see the latest military aircraft, there is a Marine Air Ground Task Force demo which features paratroopers, riflemen being flown in by helicopters while getting air support from F-18s and Harriers, as well as support from armour like the mighty Abrams M1 tank. The whole demonstration is given an air of authenticity with the use of spectacular special effects to simulate air-to-ground explosions. The Royal International Air to Two at Fairford is rather different in that it usually hosts around 240 military aircraft from all over the world. The static display stretches for nearly two miles. The first tattoo was held at North Weald in Essex in 1971. After several changes of venue, the event eventually settled at RAF Fairford from 1985. In recognition of its unique status, the current title of Royal International Air Tattoo was granted by Her Majesty the Queen in 1996. Although it used to be held every two years, it became an annual event from 1993. But in 2008, Riyadh had to be cancelled due to a sustained period of rainfall that completely waterlogged the car parks and airfields. It was particularly unfortunate as the United States Air Force F-22 Raptor demonstration team had made the first transatlantic flight to participate in the show. However, the effort was not entirely wasted as the Raptor was able to put on an astounding display at Farnborough the following week. For the first time, the public were able to see a NATO aircraft with the thrust vectoring technology that had been a feature on the Russian-designed MiG-29 Fulcrum and Sukhoi Su-27 flanker series of aircraft. Riyadh usually hosts some unusual one-off displays to mark specific anniversaries. 2014 was the 50th anniversary season for the Red Arrows, and so aircraft from other national display teams flew in formation as a salute. The military demonstration teams are a key draw for any airshow organiser, whether it is one of the country's frontline fighters or an aerobatic team. At one of the major international trade shows, the displays take on an added importance, as the aircraft's makers may well be chasing down a major order from another country's air force. Farnborough has a long heritage as one of the world's premier trade shows. Held every two years, alternating with Paris, the Society of British Aerospace Companies, the SBAC, hosts a week-long event at which the world's foremost aerospace businesses will gather and show their wares. Today, the event runs for seven days. During the week, it's all about doing business, 
and then at the weekend, Farnborough throws open its doors to the public for two long days of display flying. Over the years, Farnborough has hosted some remarkable displays and debuts, and among the most impressive have been civilian airliners being put through their paces. In 2006, the Airbus A380 made its first public appearance. It was the world's largest airliner, and at the time there had been much debate about whether it was simply too big for most airports. What was so astounding was its quietness and relative agility for such a large aircraft. During the trade week, the demonstration pilots will always be looking to show their aircraft in the best possible light. Again in 2006, the world's major aircraft manufacturers were competing to win an order from the Indian Air Force for 126 new multi-role combat aircraft. The deal was worth 8.2 billion US dollars and was to be India's largest defence spend to date. The contest featured six fighter aircraft, Boeing's F-18 Super Hornet, the Dassa Rafale, Eurofighter's Typhoon, the Lockheed Martin F-16 Frighting Falcon, MiG-35 and Saab's JAS-39 Gripen. All were present at Farnborough except the Rafale and the MiG-35 was still in its MiG-29 OVT guys. The displays were an awe-inspiring demonstration of how far aviation had come since that first show in Reims nearly a hundred years earlier. The MiG was particularly impressive as it featured thrust vectoring nozzles that enabled it to pull extraordinary manoeuvres, like being able to loop pretty much within its own dimensions. Eventually, the French Dassault Rafale won the competition, although the project has been substantially delayed due to contractual complications. Other shows aim for a more niche market, for example, the Shuttleworth Collection in Bedfordshire and Old Rhinebeck in upstate New York both feature airshows based around their collections of aircraft from the early years of flight. The Shuttleworth's Blerio 11 is a 1909 example and is the world's oldest aircraft that still flies. Given its fragility, it can only fly on days when there is virtually no wind. There are also several other replicas of pre-First War types, including a Bristol box kite and Avro triplane. Old Rhinebeck also has an airworthy Blerio, which is the oldest flying aircraft in the United States. Like the Shuttleworth's example, it will only perform brief hops when weather conditions allow, as they are very difficult to fly and control. Not only are they very tail heavy, they use a system of cables to distort the wing, which means it's not very responsive. Today's air shows rely on a mix of solo displays and the highly choreographed performances of display teams. Many of the teams are military units representing their countries and national air forces. One of the great airshow spectacles is of a group of aircraft flying in close formations, weaving patterns made of coloured smoke. Such displays were established as firm favourites during the 1920s and 30s at events like the RAF's Hendon Air Days. Flying in very close formation enabled the RAF to demonstrate the discipline and skill of its pilots. Today, a number of national air forces have display teams who fly the flag for their countries and drumming up business for its industries. One of the world's best and most instantly recognisable is the RAF's Red Arrows. The Red Arrows has a long history that begins in 1965. Before then, 
The RAF had been represented by several squadrons and training units who took it in turns to represent the service. For example, number 74 squadron, the Tigers, flew supersonic English electric lightnings. One of the most famous of these frontline squadron teams was number 111 squadron, known for its black painted Hawker Hunters. They were christened the Black Arrows and achieved what is possibly a world record of a loop with 22 aircraft at the 1958 SBAC show at Farnborough. In 1963, it was the turn of 56 Squadron, the Firebirds, flying supersonic lightnings. Training units were also keen to get in on the act, and so the Red Pelicans were formed at the RAF Central Flying School at Little Rissington in Gloucestershire. Such was the demand for their displays that the Red Pelicans took over RAF display duties so that the Firebirds could concentrate on their role as a frontline fighter squadron. The Red Pelicans flew Jet Provost trainers, which was the RAF's first jet trainer. At the beginning of 1963, the Jet Provosts were replaced by the Follens Nat. The Nat was more like a conventional fighter, in that the crew sat in tandem, rather than the side-by-side -side arrangement of the Jet Provost. It also had the performance to match. Thanks to the efforts of Flight Lieutenant Lee Jones, who was an instructor at RAF Valley in Wales, the RAF agreed to let him form an aerobatic team. Time for practice was limited, as there was a black log of pilots waiting to undergo their advanced jet training, and so it was not until July the 25th, 1964, that the new team made their first public display at Caldrose in Cornwall. The team consisted of five aircraft, all painted in daffodil yellow, which was why they had been christened the Yellow Jacks. But the team's existence was brief, and they were disbanded at the end of the 1964 season. Although there were some further up the command chain who disapproved of the Yellow Jacks, they achieved enough to convince the hierarchy that the RAF should have an official display team. Thus the decision was taken to form a new team that was effectively a new squadron removed from the control of the RAF's existing organisations, although it would remain under the watchful eye of RAF Flight Training Command. In 1965 the new team began to take shape. The NAT was chosen, although a number of aircraft were considered but were discarded either on grounds of age, availability, cost and practicality. Following his success the previous year, Lee Jones was again chosen to lead the team. He put together a team of eight pilots, seven who would fly the displays, plus a reserve. Jones had wanted to fly a team of nine, but had to make do with the seven. The Red Arrows were formed officially on March the 1st, 1965 at RAF Fairford in Gloucestershire. They took their name as a combination of the Red Pelicans and the Black Arrows, which had been one of the most famous and spectacular teams in the RAF's history. The mid-1960s was a difficult time for the RAF. It faced an uncertain future following the decision to implement huge defence cuts. The RAF needed all the good publicity it could get. The pressure on the Red Arrows to deliver that good publicity was enormous. The first display to the press was on May the 6th, 1965 at Little Rissington. Three days later, they performed at the French Air Force's National Day at Clermont-Ferrand in France. Then on May the 15th, they performed for the first time in front of the British public at Biggin Hill. Those early performances set the template for the displays that still mesmerise the public today. They began with a series of meticulously executed formation flypasts. The change for each formation was also performed in full view of the crowd, usually at the top of each loop. The team then broke into two parts, one of five aircraft and two soloists who performed as the synchro pair. Their knife edge passes at combined speeds of 600 miles per hour thrilled the crowds as much then as they still do today. 
The third part of the display saw the team reform for a final fly past in close formation. Thanks to the high standards of professionalism insisted on by Lee Jones, the discipline and closeness of the formation flying that first season was a huge success. For the 1980 season, the Red Arrows had a new aircraft, the British Aerospace Hawk. The Hawk was the RAF's new jet trainer, having replaced the Nat in the role in 1976, and is the aircraft still flown by the Red Arrows to this day. The team was now a nine-ship team, with the tenth member, who could fly ahead of the team's arrival to make sure everything was in place, as well as provide an informed commentary for the crowd. Red 10, as he is known, is still a key player in the team today. Team training had also changed, with pilots now allowed to apply from other branches of the RAF, so long as they had the right skills and over 1,500 hours of flying in their logbooks and at least one operational tour. A tour in the Red Arrows was and still is three years. Selection begins during the previous autumn and winter, followed by intense training, in which they can expect to fly up to three times a day, five days a week. Of course, British weather can be unreliable at the best of times, and so the team refines its routines over a five-week period at the RAF's base in Akateri in Cyprus during the spring. At the end of the five weeks, the team has to have its display signed off by a senior RAF officer, a tense moment for any RAF pilot. Throughout the next four to five months, the team can expect to fly at least 60 displays. Many of these will be at the big air shows, like Riyadh at Fairford, but others will be much smaller events for which they will have to operate from a base further away. They may also fly more than one display in a single day. The big international trade shows like Farnborough every two years means that the Red Arrows may well fly in formation with a new aircraft for the benefit of the visiting dignitaries and press. At Farnborough in 2006, they flew in formation with the world's largest passenger airliner, the Airbus A380-800 a truly spectacular sight given the difference in size between the aircraft. The team leader creates the display for each season. He will need to plan for three types of display. The full looping display, where the cloud base must be above 5,500 feet, so that the aircraft are not going into cloud at the top of the loop. If the cloud base is between 2,500 feet and 5,000 feet, then he will call for the rolling display. In this version, loops are substituted with wingovers and rolls. If the cloud is below 2,500 feet, then the team will elect for the flat display, which consists of a series of fly paths and steep turns. Which display the team will fly is totally dependent on the local weather conditions, and it is the team leader who has the final call. Given that British weather can be pretty unpredictable, even in the summer, it can be an unenviable task, as ultimately the team does not want to disappoint the public. Sometimes the leader simply can't make that decision until the team is actually airborne, and he might even change the decision mid-display. Demand for the Red Arrows is extremely high. At the start of the season, they can expect to receive around 800 requests. But as they can only perform between 75 and 85 displays during the summer season, it is a thankless task for the RAF events team to decide who the lucky bidders are. Where possible, the team will also try and fit in flypasts when transiting to and from a display. Today, it costs around £9 million to keep the Red Arrows. At a time when the RAF faces tough decisions on how to save money, it would be easy to target the team as an expensive extravagance. But at the same time, the team plays a significant role as ambassadors for British industry, both at home and helping win vital export orders from abroad.
It also plays its part in presenting all that is good and positive about the RAF, drawing in new recruits for the many trades that are to be found in our modern Air Force. Gentlemen, point to number one. The, the display teams from other Air Forces from around the world have experienced similar highs and lows as the Red Arrows. In the United States, there are two display teams that represent the Air Force and the Navy and Marine Corps. The Blue Angels represent the Navy and Marine Corps. Formed in 1946, they are the second oldest display team in the world, although in 2013 it nearly ceased to exist following deep budget cuts. However, a rethink of the policy saw a realisation in the value played by these display teams in presenting a positive image of the service to the taxpaying public. The team has reconvened for the 2014 season, although its performances are fewer than before. Now its six pilots can expect to fly at 70 air shows and be seen by 11 million spectators a year. The Blue Angels have flown a variety of frontline fighters. Today the team of six now flies the FA-18 Hornet. The team is split into two units, the formation team of four and the two soloists. The show features an alternating mix of incredibly close formation flying and high-speed passes by the soloists. The soloists showcase the high-performance capabilities of their individual aircraft through the execution of high-speed passes, slow passes, fast rolls, slow rolls and very tight turns. The highest speed flown during an air show is 700 miles per hour, which is just under Mach 1 and the lowest speed is 120 miles per hour. The whole team then comes together for the last part of the show for a series of formation manoeuvres. A key member of the Blue Angels is a Lockheed Martin C-130 Hercules called Fat Albert. Today, Fat Albert is used to ferry the support team from show to show, but it used to demonstrate a particularly rapid method of takeoff. The Jet Assisted Takeoff, or JATO, used eight solid fuel JATO rocket bottoms, each producing 1,000 pounds of thrust. This helped propel Fat Albert skyward and captivated millions of spectators each year. These JATO bottles were produced in the Vietnam era to help aircraft take off from short, unimproved runways at heavy weights. The last known stockpile of JATO bottles was used up during the 2009 season. America's other internationally renowned display team is the Thunderbirds of the United States Air Force. Based at the Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada, the Thunderbirds fly six Lockheed Martin F-16 Fighting Falcons. The Thunderbirds are the third oldest team in the world, having formed in 1953, but they have always been a jet team. Although it was never a formal part of the show, the soloists would sometimes go supersonic if requested by the show's sponsor. Eventually, the Federal Aviation Administration banned all supersonic flights at air shows, and consequently, today's sequence is entirely subsonic. For 1974, the team appeared with the T-38 Talon. Whilst not a frontline fighter, the Talon was still a prominent aircraft in the USAF as a trainer. But in 1982, tragedy struck when the four aircraft of the Diamond Formation crashed, killing all four pilots. As a result, the team stood down for the 1982 season and spent that year retraining and transitioning over to a new aircraft to ready themselves for the 1983 season. For 1983, the team introduced the F-16A Fighting Falcon. The team continues to fly the F-16, having switched from the F-16A to the F-16C in 1992. Only a few minor modifications differentiate a Thunderbird F-16 from an operational version. 
These include the replacement of the 20mm cannon and ammunition drum with a smoke generating system, including its plumbing and control switches. Apart from that, it's the application of the Thunderbird's glossy red, white and blue polyurethane paint scheme. The aircraft are taken from the standard USAF inventory as production fighters and can be returned to an operational squadron in short order, without any major modification. Like the Blue Angels, a Thunderbird display begins on the ground with a tightly choreographed routine that involves the ground crew and pilots. All the preparation is carried out as a series of synchronised actions in full view of the public. Even the arrival of the pilots is carefully and precisely choreographed. As they walk line abreast, each pilot peels off to join his aircraft. Much of the Thunderbird's display alternates between manoeuvres performed by the four-ship Diamond and those performed by the Solos. All manoeuvres are done at speeds of 450 to 500 miles per hour. Nearing the end, the Diamond pulls straight up into the vertical to perform the signature bomb burst, where all four aircraft break off in separate directions while a solo goes straight up through the manoeuvre and performs aileron rolls until three miles above the ground. At the end of the routine, all six aircraft join in formation, forming the Delta. The military display teams are there primarily to fly the flag for their countries and the air forces they represent. Civilian display teams exist for different reasons. Of course, the pilots are passionate about flying. They have to be, as being a member of a busy team will probably take up most of their spare time with practicing, travel between air shows and so on. Many pilots and civilian teams are ex-service pilots even a few ex-Red Arrows pilots are to be found, who now fly for the airlines during the week. A key factor for any display team, be it a single aircraft or several, is cost, and running a team of jets is extremely expensive and complex, which is why there are so few of them outside of the military formations. Having a major sponsor helps, which is why the French-based Breitling jets are so impressive. The Breitling Jet Team is the biggest civilian aerobatic team flying jets. The team flies seven L-39C Albatross airplanes, all equipped with white smoke generators. The L-39 Albatross was a very successful military jet trainer built in Czechoslovakia that was adopted in large numbers by the air forces of the former Warsaw Pact. All the team's pilots are ex-French and Swiss Air Force fighter pilots. The NAT display team is Britain's only private jet display team. Their aircraft are fallen NATs, with one painted in the yellow to commemorate the aircraft flown by the Yellow Jacks before they became the Red Arrows. The team is entirely self-funded. But despite the enormous amount of time they spend out of the cockpit dealing with the mountain of paperwork that is part and parcel of today's airshow scene, the pilots are passionate enough about their love of flying classic jets to keep them together. In 2014, the team were given the honour of flying in formation with the Red Arrows to mark their 50th display season at the Royal International Air Tattoo. But the following year, they experienced tragedy when one of the pilots, Kevin Wyman, was killed during a display. All teams have been through a similar situation at some point, but it is especially difficult for a private outfit to pick themselves up and regroup. But if you ask a display pilot why they do it, the chances are that after a pause, they will say it is their love of flying that keeps them motivated. Of course, an alternative to operating jets with all their associated costs and maintenance is to go for piston power. For any would-be display team, this opens up a wealth of choice from classic warbirds to high-performance, fully aerobatic aircraft like the Extra 300. 
The extra 300 was designed in 1987 by a German aerobatic pilot, Walter Extra, for the unlimited category in competitions. Since then, Extras have been a regular spectacle at air shows around the world, flown by individuals and in teams. The Blades is a civilian aerobatic display team situated at Sywell Aerodrome in Northamptonshire and is part of the 2XL Aviation Limited. The team flies four Extra 300 LP aircraft, all equipped with white smoke generators. The team was founded in 2005 by former Red Arrows pilots Chris Norton and Andy Offer. They both left distinguished careers in the Royal Air Force as wing commanders to create a unique aviation-based communications business offering exceptional flying demonstrations and related activities aimed at the corporate market. The team's four ship displays have been watched by more than 18 million people at over 150 venues across the UK, Europe and the Middle East. Classic warbirds remain an integral part of the airshow scene all over the world. The longest serving team that still flies its warbirds today is the RAF's Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, or BBMF as they are more commonly known. The flight's role is to serve as a flying memorial to all those RAF personnel who lost their lives during the Second World War. The BBMF's origins go back to Biggin Hill in the mid-1950s. The airfield was still a frontline fighter base, commanded by Wing Commander Peter Thompson, who had flown hurricanes during the Battle of Britain. There was a feeling within the RAF that its proudest battle owner should be properly commemorated by preserving the few remaining Spitfires and Hurricanes that had played such a crucial role in the outcome of the Battle of Britain. There was already a single Hurricane still flying at Biggin Hill, and in 1957, Wing Commander Thompson was given the authority to form a historic flight based at Biggin Hill. But there were no public funds available, which meant that the flight would have to rely on volunteers. But as luck would have it, the RAF's three remaining airworthy Spitfire Mark 19s were just ending their operational careers with the temperature and humidity monitoring flight and so they were transferred down to Biggin Hill to join the historic aircraft flight, which was already known informally as the Battle of Britain flight. The flight's first public appearance was, fittingly, on Battle of Britain Day, which is September the 15th, when the Hurricane and a Spitfire flew over Westminster Abbey. In the years that followed, the flight endured mixed fortunes, with several changes of base and accidents taking their toll on the aircraft. But in 1969, the name was formally changed to the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, and it was given a full-time team of engineers. It had also been given a Spitfire Mark II, the oldest airworthy Spitfire in the world, and a genuine Battle of Britain veteran. Today, the BBMF operates six Spitfires and two Hurricanes. The Spitfires cover a range of marks, from the Baby Mark II through to the Mark 19. A Spitfire display is as much about the sound as well as the sight. Everyone has their favourite, whether it's the Rolls-Royce Merlin or Griffin engine. Although the later versions were twice as powerful, and its maximum takeoff weight and rate of climb had more than doubled, its firepower had increased by a factor of five, and its maximum speed had been increased by a third, the airframe more or less remained unchanged. The Spitfire's role in helping secure victory in the Second World War is part of the story, but it is also one of the most graceful and charismatic aircraft ever to fly. The Spitfire's unquestionable glamour sometimes overshadows the equally illustrious reputation of the Hawker Hurricane. After all, more Hurricanes than Spitfires took part in the Battle of Britain and shot down more enemy aircraft. Also, 
There are far fewer airworthy hurricanes in the world today. The BBMF has two Mark II C variants, and more often than not, will partner one of the flight Spitfires at the many displays and flypasts the BBMF performs each year. The BBMF's other star is its Avro Lancaster bomber, which joined the flight in 1973. This aircraft had been restored at RAF Waddington during the 1960s, but its appearances were becoming increasingly popular, so the decision was taken to transfer her to the BBMF, where the full-time team of engineers would be able to take better care of her. Today, she flies as a memorial to the over 73,700 Bomber Command air crews who were either killed, wounded or shot down and made prisoners of war. The BBMF also has a C-47 Douglas Dakota, which, when not being used as a transport, takes part in displays. It is also used as a training aircraft to get pilots used to a large tail-dragging aircraft prior to flying the Lancaster. There are, of course, a number of warbirds owned by collectors who are regularly seen at air shows and who will team up with other complementary aircraft to create joint displays. A popular display in the UK is a P-51 Mustang displaying with one of the very few flying Boeing B-17 bombers in Europe. Both aircraft will fly together before separating and performing their individual displays. If time allows, they will then come back together for a final flypast. If the airfield can support it, you might even see a classic warbird flying in formation with a modern military jet fighter. Of course the aircraft are always the stars of the show and everyone will have their own particular favourites, although it's also true to say that some are more popular than others. Military display teams like the RAF's Red Arrows or the USAF's Thunderbirds will always bring the crowds in. Similarly, people want the chance to see the latest military jets being put through their bases. The noise and speed of a tornado or typhoon or F-16 performing one of their high-speed passes with afterburners glowing will always stick in the memory. Although military aircraft have long careers, the F-16 is over 30 years old, they do eventually disappear to become static displays in museums or gate guardians. They are far too complex for private operators and so there will be no burgeoning warbird scene to put aircraft like the Tornado or F-15 back in the air. For example, the Harrier was always an extremely popular display year after year at countless air shows. Its ability to hover, fly backways, sideways and even do a little bow to the VIPs was always a highlight of the show. But the decision to end Harrier operations in 2010 meant that what had once been a regular fixture on the airshow scene was suddenly no more. But just occasionally, complex ex-military aircraft are given a new lease of life. A healthy industry has grown up around the restoration of Spitfires and other veterans of the Second World War. There is even a handful of early jets in private collections but nothing had ever been attempted like Vulcan XH-558. When the mighty Avro Vulcan last flew in RAF service in 1992, no one imagined for a moment that this delta-winged giant of an aircraft would ever be seen in the sky again. In 1999, Vulcan XH-558 went into the hangar at her home in Bruntingthorpe with a plan to restore her back to flying condition. 
A vigorous campaign to raise the funding began. It would take £6.5 million just to get the aircraft ready for flight, let alone actually undertake a season of display flying. But they did it. A combination of national lottery funding, charitable donations and individual generosity saw XH-558 roll out for her maiden flight in October 2007. The operators had originally thought they might be able to display her for a couple of seasons. But thanks to the continuing flow of donations, the Vulcan was able to display up to the end of the 2015 season. By then she had flown more hours than any Vulcan that had ever been in RAF service, and so it was decided to permanently ground her in the interests of safety. The display pilot's day starts early, even if the aircraft is already parked at the airfield hosting the airshow. The pilot's briefing is the first commitment of the day, and one that is taken very seriously. Here they will learn of any changes, radio frequencies, unusual air traffic passing nearby, and crucially, weather conditions. Even high-performance aircraft are adversely affected on hot days, or on an airfield at high altitude. There may also be changes to the time slot that has been allocated to an individual's display. As the display time approaches, you will often see pilots walking around in a curious pattern, using their hands as wings. Pilots do this as a way of rehearsing mentally how the sequence will unfold. If they are part of a formation, then the whole team will walk through the changes. It is a crucial stage in the final preparations as it helps the pilots get totally focused on the display ahead. If weather conditions are likely to be a factor, then now is the time when they will work out which elements to leave out and how the winds may affect any of the figures. The pilot will then walk around the aircraft making any last minute checks such as control surfaces for free movement and alignment or remove any obstructions such as debris and litter. Once aboard the aircraft, any loose objects will need to be securely stowed away, the altimeter set, fuel balance and a final run through the display card. Then it's time to start up and when clear to do so, time to taxi out to the runway and take off. Becoming a display pilot takes an enormous amount of time. They have to be physically fit, well motivated, have plenty of free time and be free of personal worries. As well as the actual display itself, a display pilot will need to spend time practicing the routine. There is also time spent transiting to and from display airfields away from base. Physical fitness is important because some manoeuvres exert great pressure on the body. Mental fitness is also important as pilots have to perform with their minds totally focused on their routine, free of all the clutter of everyday life. They also need to have the patience to cope with bad weather days, last minute delays and changes. A good sequence will display the aircraft in the best possible light after all, it is the aircraft that the public come to see. But airshows are facing uncertain times. Economic pressures affect both parties, the organisers and aircraft operators. In Britain, the tragic crash at Shoreham in 2015 has added to the burden. Soaring insurance costs and the need for increasingly more stringent safety measures means that many of the smaller airshows have had to be cancelled as they are no longer financially viable. The knock-on effect is that there is less income for the display pilots and teams. It will take several seasons for the true impact to reveal itself, but as long as aircraft are allowed to fly, people will want to come and watch wherever they may be. Thank you.
course, there's an eviction sign. Known to all the world as...